Our moon, I'm sure you'll agree, is very beautiful. But what would the night sky look like if instead of our moon we had the moons of other planets? Come, let's find out. For this video I'm going to replace our moon with the moons from the planets of Saturn and Jupiter. I'm not just going to put them where our moon would be, I'm going to put them in relation to their position around their own world. I've done a bit of maths and I will explain the maths that I've done but at the end of the video that's just so that everyone doesn't click off now because I've mentioned maths. But if you want to know what the maths is then stick around till the end and I'll explain it. So for starters our own moon is 384,000 kilometers away that's about 239,000 miles. It has a size in the sky of about half a degree of arc. This is the same size as the sun is in the sky and that's why total eclipses work. Firstly let's try the moons of Saturn. The Saturnian system has seven large-ish moons and here we can see where they are in relation to Saturn. And so let's say how they'd look from Earth. While we're at it, how would the Earth look with a ring system like Saturn? Well I could probably do a whole video on the Earth with a ring system, but since we're in fantasy territory, the Earth with Saturn's icy rings would look like this from London. As you move further, further and further south, the rings would look thinner and thinner and thinner until once you got to the equator, they'd look like a thin line directly overhead. Anyway, back to Saturn. Saturn's largest satellite is called Titan. Here we can see it rising through the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. It would have a size of 2.3 degrees of arc, or nearly five times the diameter of our moon as viewed from the Earth. Strangely, out of all the bodies in the solar system, it appears that Titan is closest in competition to our planet. It has thick clouds we can see here that are obscuring its surface. Next, we'll move to weirdly shaped Mimas with its massive crater mark that makes it look a little bit like the Death Star. This would have a size of 1.6 degrees of arc, or about three times the diameter of the full moon. In reality, Mimas is tiny, but in my model it would only be 14,000 kilometers away. Here we can see it shining down above a street in Japan. Coming up now we have the icy moon of Enceladus. Again, in reality this is also tiny at just 504 kilometers in diameter. But according to my maths it would be just 20,000 kilometers away. And so again would look about three times the size of our own moon, with a size of 1.4 degrees of arc. Even though in my model Mimas and Enceladus would be very close to the Earth, this is still outside the Roche limit for these bodies. Enceladus can be seen here above the skies of Chicago. Tethys, the next moon on our list, would again only be about 25,000 kilometers away, and so would look huge in the sky. Or it's exactly the same size as Titan would appear, at about 2.3 degrees of arc. It can be seen here during the day over Seattle. Next, seen here over Paris, we can see the Saturnian moon of Dione, one of the four moons discovered by Giovanni Cassini. On the real Saturn, Dione orbits at a distance very similar to that of our moon, but in my model, it would orbit at a distance of just 35,000 kilometers, meaning it would have a size of about 1.8 degrees of arc. Most of Dione is made from water, which out by Saturn is frozen. Here by us, so close to the sun, that water would have melted and almost certainly evaporated away into space. But it's nice to dream about an ocean moon every now and again. A little further out, but a little bit bigger than Dione, we have another of the moons discovered by Cassini. This one's called Rhea. It would have a size of about 1.7 degrees of arc, and we can see it here over the city of Edinburgh on what looks to be a lovely summer's day. And finally for Saturn we have Iapetus. This moon is similar in size to Rhea, but because it's much further out, it would only appear half as big as our own moon at about 0.2 degrees of arc. We can see Iapetus here rising above a bridge in the countryside. Let's leave Saturn here. The planet has many, many moons, but most of them are just small rocks, not even large enough to have formed into a sphere. Now it's time to travel to Jupiter and have a look at its major moons. Like Saturn, Jupiter has lots and lots of moons, most of which are just tiny rocky bodies. I want to concentrate on the four largest moons, 
These are called the Galilean moons. And these were discovered by Galileo and proved that not everything in the universe orbited the Earth. Here were four bodies clearly orbiting another planet. No matter how many epicycles you added, these were conclusive proof that the Earth wasn't the centre of the universe. The furthest out of these moons is Callisto. This moon is actually larger than our own moon and in my model would be less than half the distance. For that reason, Callisto looks considerably bigger than our moon. And the setting that I put this moon in is a lovely sunny day at the Alhambra in Spain. Moving inwards towards the Earth, we find Ganymede next. This is the largest satellite in the solar system, having a diameter of 5,200 kilometers. And this would look huge in the sky, having a size of about 3.3 degrees of arc. It can be seen here shining down above, well, okay, I'm, I think this is New York. I could be wrong. I'm hoping it's New York. If anyone knows for certain, please let me know. Moving inwards further towards the Earth, we find Europa. I've chosen as the setting for this moon, a city very close to my heart. And for those of you who don't know, this is Liverpool. Europa is an interesting world. Out by Jupiter, it's got a surface covered by water ice. This may have oceans of liquid water underneath, safely protected against the freezing temperatures above the ice. This moon may potentially harbour conditions where life may develop. And if we were to find life on Europa, even simple life, it would undoubtedly change our view about the development of life in the universe as a whole. Here in the relatively toasty conditions that we enjoy, this moon wouldn't have an icy crust at all, it would probably have lost its water altogether. But for now, we can imagine it as a watery moon with a well-developed atmosphere, and possibly life. Closest to Earth at 32,000 kilometers away, and last on our journey, we find Io. Due to its proximity to Jupiter, this is a turbulent volcanic world. We can see it here huge in the night sky. In fact, Ganymede, Europa and Io would all look about the same size in the sky at about 3.2-ish degrees of arc. We're finishing our journey around the moons of Saturn and Jupiter above the city streets of London and the Palace of Westminster, which houses our Parliament. Well, that concludes our journey. For those that are interested, here is the math that I did to work out where I'm going to put these moons. So, as I've already said, I didn't just place them where our moon would be. I calculated where the moons should go using the following principle. Distances from planets to moons are usually quoted from the centre of the planet to the centre of the moon. This then I've cut up into two values. First of all, the distance from the centre of the planet to the planet's surface, I've called that A. And then the rest of the way to the centre of the moon, I've called that B. This then means that there's a ratio between these distances A and B here. We also know the radius of the Earth. I've used the same ratio using the radius of the Earth to calculate where the moons should go if they were at the same ratio as they are to their actual parent planets. And I've done this for no other reason than to have a bit of fun and apparently I enjoy maths. Once we know how far away something is, then it's fairly simple to work out how big it would look in the sky. And to do this, I worked out the angular diameter of the object. We know that a circle has 360 degrees, and to find the angular diameter of any object, we need to divide the diameter of that object by two times the distance to that object. We then need to take the arc tan of this number, and this is tan to the minus one, and the angular diameter is two times this number. This then tells you how many degrees wide the object would appear in the sky. For the cityscapes, I found pictures on Pixabay, which is a brilliant resource for free to use images. I credited the original creator of the content and added that to the video description below. Well, for those of you who've made it this far, thank you very much for staying with me to listen to me waffle about maths for a while. And until next time, thank you very much for watching.